Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Curious Competitor Podcast. Our guest today is Scott Livingston. He's the founder of Reconditioning HQ. He's been an athletic therapist for over 35 years, uh, spent 11 years in the NHL with the Montreal Canadiens, the New York Rangers, uh, and the New York Islanders. He has a podcast, the Leave Your Mark uh, podcast, which uh, I have actually found very effective for even my own uh, training, Scott, just given your you know Rolodex of contacts within the hockey world. And I, I've just uh, been able to check in on different topics you cover um, that relate to different areas of, of training that I'm going through. And so I appreciate you coming on. I'm excited to, nice. to throw it out. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm honored to be on the show. So Yeah, of course. Of course. I, I want to kind of jump right in because I think I, I have had other uh, fitness and athletic therapists and breathwork consultants on our podcast. So I think our listener has uh, an interest in this field. Uh, the podcasts have generally uh, done well when I cover uh, this topic, and and so I I, I want to reward our listener for um, engaging with those podcasts and and going further down that rabbit hole. And I want to understand from your perspective. So, what is neural reconditioning, and where does traditional training with sets and reps, where do those two topics diverge? Because something is going on in the brain when you're lifting weights, right? Even bilaterally and, and, you know, from a, let's say from your back, you're doing a bench press, a stable service. There's something going on in the brain. It's just not approaching the demand, the unique demands of high level decision-making uh, and understanding time and space that goes on in pro hockey specifically, but you know, a lot of different sports. So like, what's the difference there and why is it so important to pursue what it is that you do? Well, um, <clears throat> the genesis of, um, neuro reconditioning starts with the idea that um, there are sort of philosophical and narrative differences between um, the way people approach therapy and rehab and the way people approach performance training. So the narrative of the rehab professional is to um, protect in order to perform. And the narrative of the performance professional is to overreach in order to perform. Um, and so fundamentally, the narratives tend to butt heads a lot. So many years ago, like I'm, you mentioned I was an athletic therapist. I'm an athletic therapist and strength conditioning coach certified in both professionally and have been throughout my career. So I've or, always worn both hats. So I've always understood both narratives. And my sort of mission throughout my career has been to sort of marry the two and sort of allow someone to understand understand them through a language or an operating system that uh, engages the two. So fundamentally reconditioning in like rehab, basically it, it states that you are broken. Something is broken and not working, or injured, et cetera. And now you're going to go through a rehabilitative process. Training uh, sort of informs that you are healthy and you are going to try to overreach and, and, tr and, and perform. So reconditioning is this uh, continuum between the two of them where you may be injured or you may have old injuries or you may have history that we have to clean up and, and clear up in order to have a better end product in our performance spectrum. So segue forward in, in my process of my own personal growth, I always knew that I was missing something in my process in that um, the brain is the overreaching um, operating system for the human body. And most human performance professionals, as they're learning, don't really learn a lot. We learn neurophysiology, but it really, we learn it more from a muscular perspective than we really do from a, how the brain operates and runs our body. And only in the last 20 years has the neuroscience really started to catch up with what we're doing. So for a long time, and still today, quite frankly, most performance professionals and most people who train people, train people from the neck down. You're training mechanics, you're training muscle physiology, you're training um, neurophysiology of the muscles, but you're not really paying much attention to how the, the neurological system's operating. So fundamentally, every movement that you make is orchestrated by your brain. It's either orchestrated in a reflexive manner, in a reactive manner, or a response manner. And it's and and your brain is fundamentally predictive in the way that it operates. So it's always predicting what's going to happen and then defining how it's going to orchestrate motion off the back of that. 
there's an, a systematic loop on how we move. Basically, we have inputs that come from all these different input systems in our body that provide information to our brain that se- that then interprets that information and makes decisions about how you're going to create your outputs, which might be your slap shot. It might be the pass you want to make. It might be the uh, hit you have to take. It might be a whole host of different things. Or when you're lifting weights, it's in, 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 you know organizing things to push the weight or to pull the weight or what have you. So... These inputs come in and there are fundamentally three input input systems, your proprioceptive system, your visual system, and your vestibular system. You can think of them like three satellites feeding into a CPU in a GPS. So the central processing center or unit is your brain, and the GPS is basically where am I in time and space. So your inputs, your proprioceptive system is all of your joints, all your tissues that are always providing information back, the fat et cetera, that's, that's intimately engaged in and connected to the neurological system. Your neurological system isn't one or a series of wires. It's one wire that's spread apart all over your body, and it's totally taking in information all the time to understand where you are in time and space. And then it puts, so the proprioceptive system is giving you information. Your visual system is actually the dominant hierarchical system of your body. It is the main system that's telling you where you are and what you're doing. And that's why when you look at people who have a visual impairment, especially from birth, they don't move super well because they don't actually have that input system. So they have to counterbalance with the other two, which is your vestibular system. It's this tiny thing about the size of your thumb or smaller in your ear, in your inner ear ear and it's telling you it basically geolocates you from a gravity perspective so where are you in the axis of rotation and how are you moving vertically and how are you moving horizontally so these three satellites are talking to each other and asking each other to where where's Connor? Where's Connor? Where's Connor? Okay, is Connor safe? Is Connor safe? So then that's the second part is your brain interprets information and it's always interpreting first and foremost by is it safe or is it not safe? Is it safe or is it not safe? And as I said before, your brain is predictive. So it defines things as safe or not safe based on a predictive formula. What has happened in the past informs what may happen in the future. So if we go way back to ancient times, our brain was looking around to see if there was a lion. And what's the first thing that allows us to see a lion? Our eyes. Way over there, there's a lion. So your brain goes, hmm, that might be something that could hurt me. And if you've been bitten by a lion before, your brain knows it could hurt you. And so it gets even more sort of concerned about what's going on. So your brain is all always interpreting based on a predictive formula. And this is why you can't disconnect your mental performance from your physical performance. Because let's say you went into the corner one time and somebody hits you from behind and you smashed into the boards and you dislocated your shoulder, your brain now has what's called a neuro tag that effectively associates getting hit from behind in the corner with blowing out your shoulder. And so now when you rehabilitate that shoulder, you don't only have to rehabilitate the shoulder, you have to rehabilitate your mind because your mind thinks every time you skate into the corner, you're going to get your shoulder dislocated. So it's saying to you from a predictive perspective, be careful, Connor, be careful, Connor. So now you skate a little bit slower. You're a little bit more protective of your position. Now maybe you're not as reactive to the puck. And now the puck goes past you around the boards, the forward grabs it, pulls it around, sticks it in the net, and there's a goal. Well, that's not very good performance, right? So now we have a performance problem because we have a mental problem associated to this prior injury. So that's how your brain works. And it constructs all these things, you know, in in, from a cognitive perspective, but also from a there's this baseline running system that's always running subroutines because your brain couldn't couldn't think of everything you have to do. When you skate, do you think about skating? No, you skate, okay? Because your brain has a subroutine for how do I skate? I skate like this, and how do I cross over, and how do I stop? When you're a little boy and you're learning, you have to think about it, and that's why you don't do so well with the puck. But once you get good at it, then all of a sudden you can move the puck, and you can move the puck and talk to your buddy and and do all kinds of different things. That's your brain having all these subroutines that manage things. So your brain manages has all these systems. One is reflexive, so when somebody scares you and you go, ooh, that's a reflex response, you have no control of that. That, that is a that's a reflex in your body that it that runs 
regardless of whatever, it's always going. And there's reflexes that actually manage how you stand vertically, how you can maintain posture, how you can keep your head focused straight ahead and your body can move underneath you. Um, there's all kinds of reflexes. And then that's your first order of sort of motion. Then the next one is these subroutines that are constantly running. And then there's cognitive. Okay. So you're, you know how to skate, you know, but Every so often your brain goes, hey, Connor, there's a guy open over there. Psh, shoot the puck over there. That's a cognitive decision making strategy. That's when your brain's paying attention. And so when your cognitive system, your cognitive system overrides your non-cognitive system, your subconscious system, every so often when it feels you're in, it, you start to think you're in danger or you don't like the situation or you you like, you want to go left instead of right, et cetera, et cetera. So it's the overreaching runner of the system, but it also needs a lot of sugar to run and operate. So when you don't have good blood flow, when you're tired, all these things, they manifest a challenge of that system. And then that system doesn't override the, the, the system that's kind of running on, on autopilot. And that's where sometimes we can't perform because we're tired, we're fatigued, we don't have the right nutrition, da, 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 da. Last part of this whole, cer- this loop is your outputs. Your outputs are all the things that you do. And from those outputs, your brain goes, oh, I'm not, my shot's not hitting the top corner, I'm about to make an adjustment. Now I have to move this. Now it makes that adjustment. Probably most of the time, you don't even know what the adjustment is. You just know that you didn't, your brain reflected and you didn't hit the top corner. Now something happens and now the puck goes where you wanted it to go. So that's kind of the way your brain works. So back to your original question, what is reconditioning? Reconditioning takes into consideration this neurological system how we can use therapeutic systematics and approaches to improve the physical and how we can use performance systems to improve the physical, to improve your capacity on the ice. Is that a long winded answer for you to explain all that stuff? Yes, (laughs) but I I mean, you know this, Scott, I mean, it's, it's your life's work to the, the, the highest in athletes make incredibly difficult tasks look uh, so routine and so mundane, and their excellence, especially when you get up close to it. Uh, I, I know just because of the time you've spent in the NHL, the time I've spent in the NHL, when you are in front of true talent that just some, they are able to read plays so much faster, and somehow no matter what position or bounce the puck has made on its way over to their pass, uh, to their stick, there, there's an ability to corral it, feel you know their toe, of their curve and time and space and, and manipulate the puck and settle it and, and whip it into their flex. It doesn't really matter. They're, they could be at the end of their shift and, and you, you really are trying to boil down and explain like, okay, this is how really elite athletes, um, you know, who maybe in the weight room, we just had whatever on the back squat bar. They didn't like look incredibly strong, right? How does, how does Mitch Marner uh, be a, a bona fide NHL superstar? Mm-hmm. He's not someone that you would look twice over your shoulder if he passed you on the street. He, he he's put on some weight now, but when he first came in the NHL, like you know, he looked like he'd be a high school sophomore. That, mm-hmm. that there were two thousand in my school that looked like him, but his uh, his vestibular system, his visual system, he he was uh, just his hockey sense within the game, his ability to sort out like threat, not threat. This is important information. That's not important for information. I know I just skated from there, so that ice is available. And his ability to manipulate himself and others um, is world world class. Mm-hmm. And so I guess what I'm trying to approach is for the listener, I think something that gets thrown around a lot in strength and conditioning or in therapy, uh, you know, physical therapy is, you know, here with this practice or with this practitioner, we focus on the basics, right? Well, like none of what you mentioned are the basics, push, pull, hinge, uh, right. Like these, these are things that the vernacular that will get thrown at you as the basics. And so I think that vernacular falls short of mm. what's really going on on the ice. Um, I'm not saying adding, you know, uh, you know, to your nervous system, uh, uh, an ability to move your body more explosively, right. And whether it's, you know, through traditional squatting or, or weightlifting, or like I saw it, uh, another player, I thought, uh, Jack Hughes, the Devils, having a tremendous year. And Jack, when he first came in the league, was so light that he would, he would, and just so immature in his frame that 
he would, it, it would look like a 50, 50 battle and he would skid 15 feet on the ice. He'd get tossed. You know, like he, he didn't have a chance to even make it a 50, 50 battle that you knew, you know, as he approaches manhood, uh, he, he's just going to be a little bit more stable in his joints. He's just going to have a little bit more, you know, there is physics does apply to the ice, apply to the ice. Like that force just won't knock him over if he's got just a, a couple more pounds on him. Um, which is where really simple, you know, weight training program has benefit to a player like him. Now I'm 10 years down the road. This is my 10th year professionally. Um, I think I'm at my playing weight, give or take five or 10 pounds. It's not 30, you know, or 20, maybe like a, a Jack Hughes when he first came to the league where the, the difference is just so profound. And so I think it's a, a really sexy question. Like I've been on the ice and, and felt in time and space, man, I am fluid today. Uh, I like to borrow the Matthew McConaughey. His book's name is uh, Green Lights, right? Mm-hmm. I've read it uh, mm-hmm. twice. Great book. But that's what I feel like when I'm playing. It's just mm-hmm. green lights all over the rink. Um, they're uh, the safe, not safe. Uh, we were talking off air a little bit about, you know, different skating issues I've had over my career. It really boils down to what I feel is is, is one thing. Am I comfortable, like, sneak attacking people defensively? And do I actually encourage pressure? Where there's like a, uh, I'm going to play with you like a toy, like a dog with their toy. Like, I can't wait for you to come and chase me behind the net because I feel so at home in my skating. I just... I just know relatively like my ability to accelerate, but not be to sprint speed. Cause you know, then I'm, I'm on the verge of losing where I am in time and space, losing, losing control of the puck, uh, finding myself in a, in a blindside situation. Um, I know what that feels like. Hmm. And to, I guess the cherry on top, if you gave me a long winded answer, I'm, I'm getting to uh, a long winded, you know, question is I've been a player over the course of my career who every single year, as the season goes on, I continue to get better and better. And this isn't to critique who I use in the off season. I think I'm highly diligent in my in season preparation. You know, I, I I don't drink. I stay on top of my sleep. I stay on top of my nutrition. I'm I'm built to endure. You know, mentally that way. Like I, I know I'm in a fight, and I'll go all 82 games to prove that I'm better than somebody. Uh, and 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 playoff series. But I also want to evaluate my off-season routine because I feel I'm putting time in. I feel I'm working out hard. I actually work with people, you know, that, that you know, uh, who have advised, you know, programs similar to this. Um, you know, the on-ice component, you'll never reach the intensity of where there's an NHL coach making decisions based on performance in the summer. It's just, it's impossible. The, the skin in the game is not there, but I'm trying to approach it. How do I, you know, start faster and, and what is going on when green lights are approaching me and, and how specifically can the listener, especially we talked, we talked on the uh, concept of safe, unsafe all over the rink. I've had injuries, right? And I experienced that. I don't block shots the way I did before I broke my finger, my thumb, and most importantly, my ankle, right? You know, missed three, four months. Right thereafter, like it was different every time a guy wound up. So like other than sort of like exposure therapy from a clinical psychology standpoint, you know, what can the listener sort of do uh, to approach either certain exercises, certain movements that are giving them pain and particularly on the ice? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, weight in the question. And I think it goes back, like you originally started by talking about, you know, um, the fundamentals or the, or the basics or whatever. And uh, the commentary I would have first, I, I'll use an analogy um, of, of, a, of, you know, various kinds of race cars. And fundamentally, if you look at the North American model of performance, it was, it was built on the back of, um, which is, ironically associated to the same thing that we, the North American car development system was built on, which is horsepower first. So let's go and put a bigger engine in the car. And um, over time, what we've seen with the introduction of better and better um, uh, electrical systems and uh, computerized 
engineering that when you put a really high quality computer on the car, you can run a, a car faster with a smaller engine, um, a much smaller engine than the cars that were running se- many years ago on no electricals in the background. So wow, that's that. basically the same as, okay, the physiology of strength training is, you know, we can build bigger muscles that produce more force. Um, that is our primary way of making them produce more force. But the sec, the next level is is the neurological input system um, of, of the force dynamic. But then the other part of it, which nobody really talks much about, is the organizational side of how we produce force. And that is the analogy to the electrical system and the computer that we put into the car. When we have a better organizational system, we can organize force dynamics and use the force the force that we can produce to its most advantageous um, ability. And so we may not need to have as big a muscle or as much uh, direct force production in a particular, you know, linear exercise. And you have to understand when you test things, in order to test them, you have to have um, this kind of idea of uh, validity, reliability, repeatability in the test. So all tests of physical strength are defined down to something that we can actually reproduce on a regular basis, which takes away a lot of the different factors that implicate themselves in, you know, movement. So our we're kind of best guessing when we're saying if we can have a much stronger muscle, then we're going to be able to produce more force X, Y, Z. But this is why when you have uh, players that you've played with over the years, I'm sure you've seen them, guys who are uh, unbelievable in the gym and they get on the ice and they can't move the puck or they're unbelievably fast without a puck. And as soon as you put a puck in their hand, they're slow or they're super aggressive, but they can't slow down. So they're, they're always overplaying the puck or overplaying in the corner or what have you. So it's the neurological system that is actually man- managing all of that and determining when to use what, when, and how. Add on to the fact that this was the problem with hockey is that hockey, when it first, when first people started training hockey players, and it still happens a lot in the United States because a lot of United States strength and conditioning practitioners are driven through an NCAA model, which is driven by a football model. Most hockey players were trained like football players. Well, fundamentally, football player, football is about 80% physical and 20, 30% technical, tactical. Um, and it depends on the position. So you could argue, say, a quarterback or somebody, obviously there's a lot more technical, tactical, and decision-making for some of the big performance positions like the linebackers and stuff. They just got to hit things and move to places and find space, and it's it's way different than hockey. Hockey is probably 70% skill, 30% physical. So that's why Wayne Gretzky was as great as Wayne Gretzky was and why Mitch Marner is as good as Mitch Marner is because if you can find space, if you can be in the right place at the right time, if you can avoid contact, if you can move the puck supplely and and swiftly, etc., you can be a fantastic hockey player. You don't have to be the strongest guy on the ice. It can be a beneficial advantage to add on to you, but it doesn't necessarily mean you'll be able to play against everybody else. If we take the skate as an example, you can be physically strong, but do you know does your body put that strength into the ice edge and it, and you and I had a conversation before we came on about your skates your skates are your tool of the trade if your feet don't feel good in the skate it doesn't matter how much force is above it it's not going to be perpetuated into the ice to create the edges you need to be able to turn when you want etc so your skates have to be a part of your body and the funny thing is your proprioceptive system anything you attach to it becomes an extension of your proprioceptive system. So your stick is a proprioceptive device. It's why you can actually pick a puck out of the air. Your skates are a proprioceptive. You can, you at your level can actually know whether you're on your inside edge, outside edge, front, front of the, of the blade, back of the blade, et cetera, because of how good you are as a, as a player. The guys who are even better skaters than you probably even have a greater sensitivity to that, right? I remember seeing Alex Kovac 
Kovalev, who's, in my opinion, one of the best players I ever saw play, um, a bit distracted at times, but he was an ice artist. And Alex would go around and skate through 40 pucks with one skate on, on a puck and the other skate on the ice. And he could edge while he held the other sk- st- puck underneath his skate. So that was his connection to the ground. So... All this to say that um, when you're looking at how you uh, prepare the athletes in the game and the things that I do and the things that uh, training practitioners do to make you guys better, part of it is the physiology. Yeah, you have to have a certain level of engine. Um, you can make an argument that if you're going to play in the NHL, you know, you're certainly not going to play very well if you don't have an aerobic and an anaerobic capacity and you don't have at least some baseline level of strength. But there's there's a line at which once we cross that, there's a, the conversation becomes what position do you play? What style of game do you play? What's, 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 you know, are you aggressive, not aggressive? Do you have to, and everybody has a different style, right? So, in my business, my personal viewpoint is that the one, the guys that make the biggest mistakes are the ones who don't actually sit down and look at the player in front of them and understand the game that they play. So are you, are you a, um, you know, uh, a defenseman who plays back, you know, and, and plays in the back of the game, or are you somebody who's pushing the game as a defenseman? Um, are you somebody who has to really, it, it really manifests force in front of the net and is, is somebody who really takes charge of the front of the net? Or are you really a, more of a, a background soldier who moves the puck well, et cetera? What's your style? Are you a hitter or aggressive hitter, not a gr- aggressive hitter? Are you a better forward skater, backward skater? What is, what is your style of play at this point in your career? What are you going to do with your body? What are all the positions, postures, places you want to get? So I have to look at that and sit down with you and go, okay, right now, after you broke your ankle, you like to be really deep in in the seat of your stance. Do you actually have that ankle range of motion that you need in order to be able to do that? Because if you don't, then you're going to start to play a different game. You're going to be maybe on your heels a little bit more. You're, all these different things start to change, right? So that's that's the essence of neuro reconditioning is understanding what does the person in front of me do with their body? How am I going to prepare them? What are their gaps in their performance potential? Um, and which gaps matter and which ones don't. I use the word um, um, deficits versus weaknesses. You can have weaknesses that are inconsequential. A weakness that's consequential is a deficit. So in your game, you need a certain aerobic potential, but you only you don't need the aerobic potential of a cross country skier. So there's a, if you have a certain aerobic potential and your game is is you know stay at home as kind of defenseman and you're not really heavily in the rush all the time and you're not playing PP and PK all the time, then you you're running on a shorter number of minutes. Maybe you don't need the aerobic capacity. Maybe it's not a gap in your it's not a deficit. But then a guy who's playing 28 minutes a game, he probably needs a bigger engine from an aerobic perspective for recovery, et cetera. He's up and down the ice. He needs to be able to recover. So that might be a gap in his game. But then you take it another level. And if you have a guy who's really efficient as a skater, his aerobic potential might not matter because he's so fluid. He doesn't use much energy. But another guy who's kind of choppy at the way he skates, even though he's really good, uses a lot of energy to get up and down the ice. These are all the different factors that don't really get to take taken into consideration most of the time from a performance perspective. It's usually going back to your point when somebody says the basics. Yeah. It's good to to be good at some of those basic lifts in the gym, but fundamentally, you know, that's that's high school. <laughs> you know, like you need to be able to hinge, squat, press, pull, etc. You know, if you haven't done that at this point in your life, uh, you know, <laughs> you, you probably missed the bus, right? Uh, so where where you are, I have to know what you do, and I have to build a program that helps you get better at what you need to do, not not push, pull, you might be doing hinges and you might be doing squats, but, um, and you better be doing them well, but you know, there's other stuff you need to be doing. So that's really, that's really helpful. And, and uh, I, I think to pick up on the car analogy, I remember being, I was a member of the national team development program uh, with team USA and they, they do, they have a, you know, a wide ranging group of athletes that come in. It's an under 17, under 18 program. So you, you know, young training age by, by any, you know, stretch of the imagination, unless you're maybe like an eight-year-old preparing for 
uh, Texas high school football. You know, like <laughs> I see some of these kids outlift me and it's incredible. Um, Daryl Nelson was our strength coach there. He was, you know, kind of from the Mike uh, Boyle school, which I would, in my experience has always been a, a, a reductionist approach, uh, definitely a, a hyper focus on this concept of the basics, at least from, you know, movement patterns uh, and being able to load, you know, tissue and, and excite the nervous system to, you know, encourage handling more load. And he said this directly, Hey guys, uh, you know, welcome to the U S program. I'm your strength coach. Uh, every player in here, you know, is a unique, you know, sort of car. My job is to give them more horsepower. And this was very much the goal, uh, overtly, uh, for some of us that made sense. Like I was already close to the, uh, at the NCDP, I was about 185 pounds. I play around 195 now. So I, you know, even as a 16 year old, I was close to my playing weight, versus uh, Matt Grizzlick, who plays for the Boston Bruins. I think he put on like 35 pounds over the two years, 40 pounds. He came in at 135 and left at 175. And that, you know, for defensemen speak, that was like the bottom, bottom threshold you could play at in pro hockey was, you know, 175. I mean, you were in the NHL. Anything lighter than that, you're, you're, it's beyond, the conversation's beyond small uh, at, at this point. Um, and, I think to parlay it into, you know, later in my career, you know, I was, I worked with Adam Oates. I played for Adam Oates. He's been a really high-end consultant in hockey. Um, you know, he, he's studied uh, neurology from, you know, some different mentors that, you know, he's been able to, uh, you know, pass on to me. And he really does lean on this sort of Bruce Lee, um, you know, quote of like, I'm not concerned about the hockey player that's uh, done one kick or, you know, done 10,000 kicks one time. He's like, I, I want the guys that have done one kick 10,000 times. The challenge as a hockey player, and especially, I mean, you nailed it. I am an offensive defenseman, especially uh, in the American League. In the NHL, I've always been kind of a utility guy, like an ability to play all the games. If the power play quarterback goes down, I can do that. Uh, if I need a penalty kill, I can block shots. If you want to play an up the rush game, I can do that. There's a, a bit of physicality uh, to my game that's always been there where I, I don't get bullied you know, net front. And because I do a lot of these other, you know, puck skill, you know, stick on puck, breaking out type things, finding the middle of the rink, I'm generally not in my own zone uh, a lot. I would say part of my deficiency at the NHL level was not being able to run away with a specialty because that really is how they build teams. Um, with the caveat being, I do feel the onus is always been on defensemen. That you do have to be a little bit more of a generalist than I think you know, your forwards, because there is so much angling. Um, there is the aerobic demand of like, if you get caught in your own end, you got to be able to rope a dope and get to the next shift, you, you know, bend without breaking. You can't give up a goal. Right. And so I've used the analogy where, uh, not the analogy, but just the example where some of the defensemen, they really have both in the NHL. Now, like the, the, the fluidity of the average NHL defenseman now is so tremendous and the quality of shape that they're in allows them to train that that fluidity so often. Um, I mean, goodness, I, I was with the Dallas Stars. Miro Iskinen, game or practice, I never saw him double over, you know, stick on knees. Not one time. Um, incredible shape. And his warm-up was this, like, I mean, you'll, you'll chuckle at this. Uh, he... I, th I think he's got a little bit of, I don't know if it's Michael Jordan in him or Kobe or whatever, but he would like head without headphones, just jog in a circle for like 45 minutes <laughs> before the game, you know, finish heavy emphasis on aerobic fitness, you know, sauna culture, you know, big into cycling. And I just, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, you know, this guy's a, a complete horse. He, he plays the whole game and he just jogged for 45 minutes. And I saw him practice yesterday and I, I haven't seen him on a wind, you know, once. Um, to, to bring this back around, I think you, you touched on the ankle. I, I, we shared uh, some notes pre the podcast and I found this interesting, right? So, so I had this ankle injury. It does end up in uh, pain when inflection from time to time, especially when the workload's high, which leads to some creakiness, <clears throat> excuse me, up in the hip, like just a discouragement. Like if I'm going into a squat, I end up kind of veering towards my left heel, you know, favoring into the left glute. The right glute isn't as excited to, you know, receive, you know, some of my weight. Um, and I think a lot of that stems from the ankle and then I'll do my proprioceptive exercise. You know, I, I feel, you know, all five toes, I, I call it like a Spider-Man feeling all of a sudden, like all of a sudden, you know, my feet, there's a lot of nerves that are, are so alive, you know, and then 
this is part of the reason I've always engaged with strength and conditioning and, and physical therapy, like on my own is it, it's a, it helps me move from discipline. Like, Oh, I have to go out and work hard today because that's like my job to, uh, a very motivated state. Like all of a sudden I'll do some of my proprioceptive ankle stuff and something's online that wasn't there 10 minutes ago. And now I'm excited to play and see how I feel. And, and, I, and I can't wait to get on the ice. I can't wait to skate. My hip is excited and interested in receiving, you know, my weight. Um, I, I just don't understand how it's been years and like pain does creep up. Right. And I go home, I go th- for the summer, I do my treatment. I feel good. I come into the season and it, and it creeps up again. And so is it, is it like a not doing your homework type thing? Is this a, you know, the human body just sort of doesn't forget significant injuries like this. And, and maybe even mechanically, like I have screws in there, like maybe there's just a, a, a physiological biomechanical impediment with the screws and with the injury and the scarring. I'm not, you know, I'm a little beyond my depth here. Um, but it's, it's become a bit of a mystery and it came up in a podcast recently. I thought this was really rich and, and maybe you'll, have something to add. Uh, Jack Hahn is a hockey consultant, similar to Adam Oates. And he was discussing this. He had a, had a client that had an ankle injury, kind of glazed over it. And he's like, man, the more homework I do, the more related to ankle injuries and specifically uh, cases of the yips in the MLB, um, cases of guys retiring early in, in basketball. They just, they just don't feel right for whatever reason. Hockey, I think, is a little hidden from that just because eventually we do get back to that boot, which again becomes our extension, you know, with the rest of uh, our sport. But the ankle in particular, I find tricky. A lot of a lot of threads to pull on there. Um, well, first of all, your, um, your body uh, connects with the world. Um, ex- eccentric are uh, external of, of your skin and your eyes and your vestibular system with your hands and your feet. So your hands and your feet are very rich from a proprioceptive and neurological perspective. There's uh, actually, you can Google this afterwards, look at the human humunc- homunculus, it's called. And a homunculus is a neurological expression of how much um, nerve endings are in certain parts of your body. So if you take a picture of a, or if you look at a homunculus man, it's called, you'll see huge hands, huge feet, huge lips, uh, huge genitalia, tiny skinny legs, tiny skinny arms, kind of tiny skinny body. Because your body, your arms, your legs don't have a lot of neurological feedback information coming to you. Your hands do, your your feet do, your lips do, etc. Um, so you know areas of uh, uh, you know sexuality and areas of how we connect to, you know, um, the ground and the earth and the world. Okay. So when your feet are not happy, (laughs) you start to have what we call ground up issues. So we can have top down issues or bottom up issues, top down are your, and we can have center out, I call them issues. So your brain and neurological system are your top down issues. Your feet are your proprioceptive and ground contact issues. And your trunk are your ability to create sort of and manifest what we call a, a point of fixation in your trunk because your trunk is kind of the center point for all load to be transacted through your body, right to left arm, etc. When we pull, everything is kind of this right, left, left, right kind of concept. Um, and so at the end of the day, when you're, when you've broken your ankle, you've changed the, the neurodynamics of the foot. It's no longer producing the same information. So when we talk about input, the input dynamics to your brain have been changed. Okay. Um, and they will probably be forever changed if you've got screws in there and other things. So anytime you've had surgery, scars change proprioceptive dynamics, screws in your ankle change proprioceptive dynamics. So what happens is that the, Brain starts to have this kind of argument between the three satellites, the visual, vestibular, and proprioceptive about where your foot is in time and space. And what you have to understand about pain is pain has been for many years sort of contemplated as an input. It's actually an output. It is not, it, it, you have what's called nociception, which is you have two different kinds of, to make it simple, two different kinds of fibers that bring information into your brain. And your nociceptors, which are the guys that tell you about things that are noxious, okay, they are very thin and they are slower than all your proprioceptive fibers. 
So, but they're constantly sending like noise up to your brain. They're always sending something. And your brain is the one that determines whether the threshold of that noxious information is worth getting stressed about or not. Okay. So when we go back to that idea of threat dynamics, your brain determines whether that nociception is worth thinking about and worth getting upset about and creating pain to acknowledge it. That threshold is determined by your psychology, your mindset, your energy, by your fatigue levels, by the amount of overload you've taken, by the amount of food you've eaten. Um, All these different factors actually factor into whether you feel pain or don't feel pain. But pain is an output and effectively your brain is using the pain to get you to stop doing something that you're doing. And the question then becomes, why does it want you to stop doing what you're doing? Is it because you're tired? You don't have enough food? You are, you don't have enough energy that you're in a bad mind state that it feels threatened, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what we do is we go, Oh, my ankle's the problem. I'll let go down and treat the ankle. I'll go down and treat the ankle. It's the ankle's the problem. It might not be your ankle that's the problem. Okay. And so you want to start to think about or look at trends of when your ankle starts to make more noise. Are you well hydrated? Are you well slept? Have you had uh, a snack recently or some kind of, you know, um, carbohydrate in your body that, so that you have the appropriate amount of glucose circulating in your, in your body? Have you had a lot of stress? Did you have a fight with your girlfriend last night? Are you, did the coach give you shit for something you did stupid yesterday? Da, 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 all these different things. That's why psychology cannot be dissociative from the physiology. And that's why in some of the sports sites listening, I might get mad at me, but I don't believe in the black box philosophy of sports psychology. I think that it's important for you to have an intimate relationship with your sports psychologist with regard to things that are, are of, of a, uh, emotion centric, um, and private matter. But when it comes to your performance, the psychology of your performance, the, the things that you're doing that may be creating stress or, or not, we all need to know as performance professionals, whether you're under stress, I don't need to know necessarily why you're under stress, but I need to know you're under high, heightened stress because that's going to affect the workout I'm going to deliver to you, how you're going to respond to that workout, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Last part of the equation is when we, when I look at bodies from a neuro reconditioning perspective, we look at what are hardware issues in movement and what are software issues. So true hardware issues are when you actually have true restriction of a joint based on some kind of traumatic history. So you have screws in there, scars, fractures, uh, labral tears, all these different things. If there's no mechanical history, then the restriction in your joint or the inability to coordinate and control your joint is a software, i.e. neurological problem. So I need to figure out where is that neurological problem based? Is it proprioceptive? Is it visual, vestibular? Is it interpretive? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so most of the time from a performance perspective, uh, you know, up until the last, say, 20 years, our solution set for most software-oriented problems has been some form of proprioceptive input And we haven't even acknowledged that it's proprioceptive. We call it therapeutic. So when we do soft tissue release and when we foam roll and when we stretch and we do these things, we call them stretches, foam rolling, soft tissue release, et cetera. But they're all forms of proprioceptive input. We're enriching the system. The system acknowledges where it is. It it depreciates pain, et cetera. And that's why when you meet somebody who's a great massage therapist and you feel connected and warm and fuzzy and stuff, you come out afterwards and you feel better because we've, we've downed, down regulated your proprioceptive system. And that's why all this down regulation stuff is becoming big vagus nerve, uh, meditation, breathing, yoga, et cetera, for you guys, because you're up regulated all the time to go and play and have you know, 220 pound guys come and smash into you in the corner. And so afterwards, when you're upregulated, you may feel more pain, et cetera. So how do we downregulate you? We do breathing, meditation, et cetera. But the caveat to all that is not everybody responds to things the same way. So something you think your brain thinks is threatening, my brain might think is non-threatening. So you foam rolling might be threatening. Me foam rolling might be wonderful for my brain. 
So that's why we don't just go, everybody foam roll, everybody stretch, everybody do yoga, everybody breathe like this. And the problem is when you do that, which is the nature of working with a team, <laughs> everybody's got to go in the room and do the stretch or the warm up or the foam roll or whatever. You're doing it because the literature tells you that for 70% of the guys in the room, this will work. Well, there's always the 30% it doesn't. So have you actually done some kind of assessment to know who it works on and doesn't work on? Because at your level, you can argue it's kind of challenging to do with a high school football team when you're one strength coach and there's a bunch of kids who may or may not become professionals. But when it comes to your your game, it should be an individualized approach. So I've done a lot of <laughs> digging. No, that this is awesome, Scott. And I, I really appreciate the, the level of, of detail and intensity. And, and I, I think hopefully this is illuminating for uh, the listener. I imagine it will. I found this to be true as I progressed through my career. Uh, there are a lot of, you know, really well-meaning people, um, you know, who have, have hard-earned certification and education levels. Uh, but when you really start to get into performance and particularly, you know, physical therapy and the, and the strength conditioning, what, what really is all under the um, cone of, of performance, uh, y- you would be shocked at the interdisciplinary approaches that are emerging and becoming more popular. Uh, and there are some really high-end professionals that can explain why your favorite athletes are able to do what they do night in, night out, decade de- uh, decade out. Uh, and, and a lot of them have been a part of their teams. Uh, and, uh, and I advise, you know, as, as with, you know, within your financial picture, if you can recruit and work with these people, um, you, you'll be surprised at uh, how much you're able to learn and, and do immediately. This is not, uh, everything theoretical that we discuss has real world application. And, and there's a divergence sometimes between what you've been doing and what you will do now, uh, when you're able to work with someone, you know, like Scott, uh, you know, Sam Gibbs was the gentleman that uh, had introduced us. I was, you know, very fortunate to work with Sam when I was in Toronto. He was this sort of, um, trajectory interruption, uh, mechanism in my career where, you know, I was doing some things and he kind of turned me around and goes, go, what, you know, was able to explain A, B, and C you've been doing are, are really helpful uh, and, and are part of what's gotten you here. Uh, D, E, and F is noise and junk and stuff that you do because you think you need to work hard and you need to stop because it's actually undercutting your success. Um, and then, you know, went on to provide additional tools that I, I wasn't aware that I was unaware of. Um, how much storytelling do you invite your athletes in when, when they come to you? How much of the, you know, psychology, uh, do you start to investigate? Cause this is something that I've considered in my own career. My dad, when I was young, I was not a fast runner, right? I played baseball, a uh, great skater, uh, you know, not a fast runner. And he would just, he would say like, <laughs> like you got to run faster first base when you hit the ball. And I was like, what do you, what do you think I'm trying to do? Like, of course I'm trying. And, you know, I was talking back as a, as a 12 year old or whatever. And he's like, from now on, like, just, just think, just think you're fast. Right. And I think there was really tremendous wisdom in what my dad was trying to get at. And, and that is, he was inviting me, you know, to, if you are to move fast, you really, from an imagination standpoint, your nervous system is, is listening to how you feel about yourself. Uh, the state from which speed, speed will emerge, there needs to be a seed planted that you actually believe that you are fast. Um, and this is something I thought was really interesting about my own personal psychology. One, one of the things, for example, I, I really believe this, um, was that I was a good athlete amongst great athletes, you know, other pros, but I, but I, but was special about me was my, my work ethic and how, uh, diligent I was. And then I, I really started to open my eyes to like, wow, um, there are certain athletic gifts that I overlooked, right? So I have a very thick, uh, lower half, you know, glutes, quads, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, thick this way and it's helped me have play this, um, varietal style I mentioned in the NHL. It helped me, you know, play a fast game It helped me play a physical game. If I needed to, if I was any smaller, like the, the, I would have to be even that much better 
uh, you know, to have made it because the conversation gets, gets harder. And people have asked me, you know, oh, Connor, how do, how do you get that big? I'm like, I did the same workout every other guy did. It's genetics, dude. Like, I'm sorry. Like, I, I, I was a hyper responder to whatever, uh, whatever food I input, whatever sleep I had, whatever exercise. And uh, so I, I guess when you have an athlete, there are elements of their personal psychology that have encouraged their behavior and, and, and let's call it like pro behavior, behavior that's in their best interest in alignment with their goals. And then there's behavior I'm sure you recognize as a practitioner, like, ooh, red flag. I could see where when the lights are on or your, your effort has not been going uh, very well, um, there's, a, there's a block here. And uh, how much of that conversation will you engage with as a practitioner or how often have you invited the athlete to say, hey, I noticed this. I think you need professional help in this realm. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, it's the, to some degree, it's a million dollar question around performance because, uh, and I've had this question with friends of mine who were sports psychs and other people in performance, you know, um, what is the fire uh, in your engine that create has created the success to this degree at this point, and how does it serve you, and how does it not serve you? And the question always is: if you if you um, diminish the fire or put it out in an effort to be healthier or to have a better outlook on on all things performance, um, are you still able to play the same game that you played? Um, and what was that game and how, you know, what was your identity in that game? That, that is a big psychological animal in the room. And, um, really any psychological change in the terms of, uh, mindset or deeper consideration requires, um, the person to manifest that change and to desire to create that change. So as a professional, my goal is to understand the person as they are and understand their quirks and quirks and what, what they are. Um, and uh, from time to time, point out or be curious or bring question to them that makes them ponder or consider. And then some of those problems can be things that can be easily solved with some mindset work that's not necessarily deep psychological practice. And some things need somebody who's more of a professional in the box to get into and understand what are the, you know, what are the things in the back, the traumas, et cetera, that maybe are, have defined this practice or this, this strategy. So that's the deep box that somebody professional in sports psych is, is, is built to, to, to work with and to understand and to go into. But I think every human performance professional, this, this is my belief anyways, that anybody is in human performance, especially at the level of professional needs to have a working understanding of all things performance, whether that's nutrition, physiology, psychology, call it, I call it mindset and mental preparation, um, you know, n neurology, et cetera. You need to sort of have a working understanding of it. You don't need to have expertise. And then you choose, so I call it a, a generalized specialist. My specialization is the the physical and the and the and the injured because of the two hats I've worn my, throughout my career. You might have somebody who's perf performance centric, somebody who's medical centric, but we all have a responsibility to understand the continuum and uh, and to be a part of it. I've had many athletes say to me over the years because the thing about being a prof and you know this yourself, having worked with strength conditioning coaches, when you when you build a, a quality intimate relationship with an S and C practitioner. They're your bartender because they're the guy you see the most other than your, your, and even I, I would argue more than say, your head coach or whatever, maybe an assistant coach might come, might come close in some, in some cases in, 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 in hockey because there's an intimacy there and stuff. And they take that sort of role as the person who can be your, your big brother a little bit, but the head coach, there's always a, a distance to a degree. So your, your strength, and conditioning and performance coach becomes the, the bartender. They're listening to you through the summer. If they're working with your team, they're also there all the time. And, and as, as the therapists are, the therapists become forms of bartenders as well. So that's why those relationships are intimate, focused. We have to sort of be aware that sometimes you're going to talk to me about things nobody else knows. Um, and I'm going to see you at your worst and at your best and understand. And, and I have to be there to support that. So not understanding the psychology of that is kind of a gap in my performance capacity. Um, so... 
That's, I, I don't I, know I if that answers agree. your question. But I that's, completely uh, agree, and I, I really feel similarly about uh, as a hockey player. Like, I'm overwhelmed sometimes. You, you know, there's elements of our training that are very similar to a, court, a quarterback. We make decisions at really high speeds with uh, all sorts of different scenarios on the rink. Uh, we've all seen these examples of certain players that have these offices where, for whatever reason, they call areas of the rink home, and then they might have to make a similar – I'll give an example, you know, so – I I'm a defenseman. I go back and I break a lot of pucks out as the last, you know, player back. This is a it, it's a highly physical confrontation. It's highly predictable. Like we we play uh, offensive rushes against in a certain way to put us in positions that are familiar. And I remember, you know, courses uh, over certain courses of my career where I'd, I've seen really high end forwards. It's not a lack of skill. It's just they're kind of in the deep end and they're not you know, totally ready for this where, you know, $10 million your players go back on breakout pucks and they don't know what to do because they're unfamiliar. Uh, I was a high end, uh, you know, offensive power play quarterback was kind of the name through junior and, and through the American league. And then all of a sudden I'm in the NHL and I'm playing the half wall, you know, kind of in the Ovechkin Stamco spot and I, I, different angles. I don't really know what to do. The pucks the same size. Like I'm still the skills of skating, uh, uh, stick handling and shooting are all, you know, a, a part of the equation still, but it's on a unique part of the rink. Um, and, I'll, and so I, I think that as, as hockey players, there are demands to understand our game from a general perspective, understand specifically, you know, what our role is. Uh, Scott, the conversation we've had is, okay, what, is your, what are the demands on your body? What are the risks uh, that you face? What are the strengths that they're really paying you for? Um, and, uh, I, I really encourage the listener to, you know, really evaluate your own play and, 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 or if, if you don't know, have conversations with teammates or parents or coaches that you trust. And when you have a really high end culture, uh, around performance, this emerges, I, I gave an example, I think I, I can't remember if I said on Instagram or on a podcast, I had a teammate recently. I do this little like right foot, left foot skid on my right shot, you know, where I, I look like I'm going to take a little sifter wrist shot from the blue line off my back foot. And I pull it back to the middle of the rink and, you know, try and dance a guy. High, you know, high risk play, generally reserved when, you know, we're down a goal. And a teammate of mine kind of nudged me. He's like, hey, dude, I haven't seen you pull that off recently. What, where's that? And sure enough, like that night I did it, you know? And, and, and so it's, if you can continue to a, approach this idea of, okay, I, I know what green lights feel like on the rank. Uh, I know which ones are most familiar to me. How can I kind of reverse engineer uh, areas of my body or the rank that I'm unfamiliar with um, and, and continue to approach better? The, the good news is I feel like as a hockey player, there's so many different ways to get better. The difficulty is like at some point you've got to get out of your head and do something, <laughs> you know, and, or find the right person and, and stick with it. Um, I really like your uh, your perspective there, Scott. I think that's very helpful. Well, it's it's funny uh, to elaborate on what you were just talking about. I mean, there's the um, you know there was this big argument for a little while that was brought up around uh, the research uh, that was done and sort of de defined the idea of the ten thousand thousand hours of practice and that you just needed to do a lot of practice to get good at something. And then you know people started to dive into it deeper and recognize that it was you know connected practice that you did. So effectively, you, you have to be connected to what you're actually making happen versus just going out. So if you go out and do you know five iron shots and you just keep hammering them, it's, you're not going to get better at a five iron. You have to be connected to what you're doing and expressing. So that connection then. You may not have to do as many reps, but you need to be, it needs to be connected practice. So in the same thing that you're doing as an, an NHL player, you can think of it as a go back to that idea of, you know, reactive um, uh, and then that subroutine area and then that cognitive piece, you're building these subroutines by practicing things. You're building these neurological subroutines. That's how I do a snapshot. That's how I do a slap shot. This is how it goes. This is how it integrates with this motion. Your body builds on like scaffolding on all these things. And this, the simple thing, when simple concept of learning is you start out in any new skill in a, in a place of unconscious incompetence it means you don't know what you don't know how to do. 
then somebody entered. So you didn't know how to do a, a snapshot when you were a kid. Somebody, some coach showed you how to do a snapshot. Now you're consciously incompetent. You can't hit the net with the puck, but you're, you're trying it. You're doing it right. Then you practice a whole bunch of times and hopefully you're connected to your practice. You become more consciously competent, which means you have to think every time you go to make that snapshot, but, but now it's hitting the net and it's going in the net and stuff. Eventually you become unconsciously competent, which means your body can do it. It becomes a subroutine because you can do it without thinking. So what then happens is you start to layer these subroutines and these different scaffoldings of movement into a, in a quality dynamic profile. As you described, that's your profile of play when you were in the AHL was to play in a certain way. When you went to the NHL, coming back into the brain, into the brain is if the co- coach doesn't acknowledge the type of player that you are, or the system doesn't allow for you to, to express it in that way, or it asks you to express it in a different way, all of a sudden you have all these subroutines and scaffolding for this player profile identity, but now that identity has been changed on you. So now you've gone from being unconsciously competent at the profile you express to now consciously competent, which means you have to think about what you're doing. As soon as you have to think about what you're doing, you get slower. So then you don't play as well, which then creates psychological doubt. So going back to your point earlier about belief, you no longer believe you're quite the player you were because you're not being asked to play the way you used to play. You're playing this new style. So fundamentally, you have to rebuild that unconscious competence and that sensitivity to this new player profile, which requires connected practice in that profile. If you fight it or you don't have enough time to do it or you feel overwhelmed by it, then you never actually acquire that unconscious competence you're kind of on the bubble. And the last layer of that is in your system, whenever you re- reach unconscious competence, you always have to continue to overreach and try novel expression so that you challenge the system to be able to, to find different outputs of the same sort of format system, right? So um, that's kind of, in a nutshell, why that was challenging to you in some sense, uh, and maybe is still challenging to you because you have to rebuild your belief in yourself as an athlete playing this new style. Yeah, that's really, that's really helpful. And I, I think, Scott, this was uh, really comprehensive, and I, I appreciate uh, your insight, your experience, uh, and your your intensity to try to boil down my life's work, boil down your life's work, uh, mm-hmm. and, and discuss what is you know really high end uh, decision making in the face of travel and fatigue and time change and injury. A uh, lot of impressive sports out there. You, you've worked with beyond uh, just hockey, but you know a lot of our conversation was around hockey today. Um, where can, uh, from our conversation today, I, I know you have your own podcast where can keep people, uh, continue the conversation if they're, they were intrigued about a particular point, uh, you're active on social media, Instagram as well. Uh, where can people find you? Yeah, they can find me on Instagram at King O pain. So King O pain or zero, uh, not zero, but O pain. It's not King of pain. Uh, Twitter, I'm at built, at built by Scott. You can find me on LinkedIn and on my name, Scott Livingston. Um, I also, uh, my website with my wife, Jamie, reconditioninghq.com is where we all, you can find all of our courses. And I have a podcast called Leave Your Mark, which is on pretty much every streaming service that uh, I'd love to have more listeners to. So um, reach out and you can find all kinds of really qu- high quality humans and human performance on that site. I've got about just over 300 pods now uh, out there and, and counting. Yeah, I'd love to be a fly on the wall at your and Jamie's uh, you know, dining room table someday where you, you just you disagree over what an athlete's sticking point is and, <laughs> and you're, you're dissecting and going toe to toe. And you know, I'm, a, I'm a married man and, and I, I love my wife and we disagree over you know, all sorts of things and uh, agree over more. Um, we, have a, we have a good relationship, but, but I could only imagine if she were to come home one day and be like, you know what? I just disagree with the way you're going back on pucks or I, I really think your movement practice has been hampering. You've been doing the zone two nonsense is overrated, you know, and I, I think I'd flip the table. I think that'd be it. That would be, that would be a riot. Um, 
I appreciate you don't want to being married Scott. to my wife. She's actually understands hockey better than me. I remember sitting in this, the audience and she'd be like, why is he doing that? And I'm like, how, wh- what do you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What did you see? Good athlete. <laughs> yeah. It's incredible. Good stuff. Well, I appreciate you, your time, Scott. Did you say you said you still want me to read that, that piece from yes, my book? Yes. Uh, you, you know what? Our, our, our conversation was, was, uh, so intense. I, I didn't want to break from it in a, in a good way, but there was a, there's a book and maybe you can relay the backstory. We'll end with this. Um, that was influential in your life and, and you read an excerpt about me, you know, where I was, uh, what, what information did you need for, need for me when your I was birth, born? Your birth month and day. Month and day. So I was born April 13th, uh, 1994. Uh, and, and this was relevant, uh, to which, uh, reading I received and, and you gave it to me on your podcast. I thought it was really interesting. Maybe we could share with the, the audience. Well, I hope I read you the right one because when I went back and looked at my um, my um, thing from you, it was I had April. Oh, I think I had April fourteenth, but you were born April thirteenth. So I hope I read you the right one. Well, even I better, I'll get a fresh that. one then. I'm, I'm, I'm even more intrigued. <laughs> so you're an Aries four, and your purpose is to be secure enough with your individuality that you can position yourself between two points of view and not lose sight of your truth to manifest. That truth in a world divided by conflict, a world that offers you both support and open hostility. A, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. George Bernard Shaw. The Aries Four is different and everyone knows it. In fact, they are catalysts, people who affect the lives of others in a profound way. Their energy is explosive. The Aries Four needs to remember that self-control comes from inner discipline. If they can't confront what is really bothering them, then anger and frustration will build and it won't take much to set them off. Their challenge is to keep a clean inner house so they don't explode at the wrong time, at the wrong person over the wrong issue. They are attracted to tension, dispute, and the feeling of being pulled apart. The tug of war between two worlds, two religions, two strong people gets them going. The Aries 4 needs to learn to live in someone's world, but not to lose sight of their own. Friends are important to them and are from all different walks of life. Eclectic in the way they dress, their love of change often prevents commitments or stability. Living on the earth plane is a challenge. They're inventors, rebels, geniuses, and instigators. They move suddenly and their reaction time is remarkable, but they are also accident prone, driven and inspired others uh, have trouble at keeping up with their pace. There are, they are either un, undercover or demanding maximum attention. Until they learn to accept themselves, identity can be a crisis. Anthony Perkins, April 4th, became an actor to escape himself. There was nothing about me I wanted to be, he once said, but I felt wonderfully happy about being somebody else. Uranus rules the individual. It represents how you you have uniquely put together your experiences, your beliefs, and your feelings. When coupled with Mars, the world either admires the Aries for uniqueness or turns its back and runs. In the world of Emerson, words of Emerson, whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. But uh, if an Aries 4 is having trouble fitting in, they need to review what is causing their difficulties. Their style is not gentle or flexible, but shocking. And and so if what they have to offer is also difficult to digest, they may find themselves alone. Gentle or flexible. Yep. Yeah, I'd uh, definitely some interesting points there. And uh, <laughs> I'll leave it to the audience and loved ones and friends and family, uh, teammates, uh, to review that, we could talk about it over coffee, lunch, dinner, beer, whatever. Um, Scott, thank you for that. I really You're appreciate welcome. it. Um, I uh, this was awesome. So you know, maybe we'll do it again. And and again, uh, if you have not checked out the Leave Your Mark podcast, I uh, check in every once in a while and uh, really appreciate your work there, Scott. So thank you for for today and for doing. Thanks for thing. having me on, buddy. Appreciate it. 